Alright, this last presentation in this module is going to talk about network address translation. This is something you probably rely on every day, and uh, something I wanted to cover really briefly before we moved on to the bigger routing protocols in the next module. So, the problem that we have is there are very few IPv4 addresses uh, based on, you know, compared to the number of internet devices in the world. And uh, IPv4 wasn't designed to account for the explosion that occurred um, when the internet finally took off. So IPv4 offers about 4.3 billion, and not all of these addresses are usable. You'll remember we have some that are reserved for multicast. Some of these addresses have special purposes. So by the time you get done, there aren't a whole lot of addresses around for us in comparison to, you know, say the population of the world right now. Um, so many people uh, have more than one internet-enabled device, even. So you talk about 7 billion people, even though not all of those people have internet. Um, I believe I saw a statistic earlier, there are an average of five internet-connected devices per person on the planet right now. So network address translation provides us with kind of a workaround, if you will. And basically it allows for one address to be mapped to another address. And it allows entire private address ranges to be placed behind a few public addresses. And this is the very important part, is that we don't have to have too many globally routable IPv4 addresses. All we need are a few, or possibly even one, IPv4 address, and we can have a number of devices that rely on that one IPv4 address to get to the internet. This is probably what's happening in your house right now. And that also provides uh, security, because you don't have to worry about mappings uh, sticking around for very long. These mappings, are, uh, depending on the configuration, are usually dynamic. And so what will happen is uh, when you connect to the internet, you'll be mapped to the one address and port pair. And then when you go out to the internet for a different connection, you'll be mapped to a different address and port pair. Um, and so this can really actually secure your network by quite a bit. It also allows for internal network development without having to worry about getting more public addresses. In an addressing system where everything runs on the public address, expanding your network actually involves acquiring more public IP addresses, and uh, this can actually be very, very expensive in the case of some uh, bigger networks. So what we have to do is, instead of doing that, we only have to worry about expanding the private address ranges that are already possibly in use, and then buying, you know, possibly only a few more external addresses to account for the number, uh, larger number of hosts on the inside network. It's also useful in networks where uh, we possibly have address ranges that overlap. So, say for example, two merging companies that both use 192.168.1.0. What we can do is, rather than changing the addresses on both networks, or changing the addressing on one network and leaving it on the other, is we can use network address translation to make one of the networks appear to, uh, to the other network as 192.168.2. And uh, that way we don't even have to worry about actually changing the physical addresses on the device, or not physical addresses, but the IP addresses on the device. All we need to do is change, uh, to look at the way that they're mapped. Okay, so now we're going to go over all the different types of NAT. Uh, the first type is called static NAT, and this is basically just a one-to-one -one mapping. You're mapping one IP address to another IP address directly, all ports, and basically for this type of NAT you need one public address for every single private address that you have on your network. The second type is called dynamic NAT. This is a little bit more uh, sophisticated because it actually maps an address to one of the public addresses in a pool. And so basically, you need a big enough pool to support the number of simultaneous internet connections you require, and as long as you have enough addresses in the pool, all of your devices can get out that need to get out. Uh, the second type here is PAT, and PAT stands for Port Address Translation. Um, and so uh, you can basically do the same concept as NAT, but with individual TCP and UDP ports. Um, and so static PAT is where you map one address pair uh, to another port address pair, and it's typically called port forwarding. On consumer routers, you will do port forwarding. Um, this is basically what port forwarding is, is you're forwarding one external address and port pair to one another internal address and port pair. Um, and so you also have what's called dynamic PAT, and this is where a single port address pair is mapped to a pool going outbound, and this is called NAT overload. This is typically what you'll see on consumer routers where you'll have several devices behind a single public address, and every port that needs to go out goes out on a different port on the public address. Now, the terminology associated with NAT can be a little confusing, so I wanted to go over it here, and this is terminology that you'll see a lot on the CCNA exam. They require you to know the difference, so uh, let's get right to it. Inside local address is considered the private address of a private host that's being mapped to a public address. So whenever you have a private to public mapping, when you want to talk about the private address, it's called the inside local. The inside global address is the associated public address with this private to public mapping. On the other hand, we have the outside global, uh, which is when you have a 
pri public to private mapping. That is the other way around. So normally with NAT you're going to go from inside to outside and you're going to translate outbound. But um, with some types of NAT you may actually find that we need to translate inbound. And so with, we, when we do that we have what are called outside global addresses where the outside global address is going to be the uh, outside address that is the public address uh, that is being mapped to the private address. And then the outside local address is going to be the private address that's associated with that outside host. Um, I, I can kind of like make a diagram of this and show you in person if you want or uh, I suggest you read up on it in the book too to hopefully give you a little bit of clarification as to what these mean. These are very important. Again, they do come up on the CCNA. So uh, now we go on to NAT configuration. Uh, it's fairly straightforward depending on the type of NAT. So on the interfaces, you'll want to specify an inside and an outside interface. And I've given an example of how you do that here. Um, so for a static NAT, you're going to say IP NAT and then what source interface you're going to. Source static and then the real and mapped address. So you can NAT inside or you can NAT outside. Now if you say NAT inside, that means that you're going to end up mapping a private host to a public address. So the real host is private, the virtual address is public, and if you say IP NAT outside, it's going the other way. So the real host is public and you're mapping it to a virtual private address. Now we also have dynamic NAT, which I discussed, um, and this you have to create a NAT pool and you basically specify the first and last address, address there as you can see. And then the access list uh, is used to define what inside hosts have access to this pool. And the command goes IP NAT inside source list and then you reference what access list to find your inside addresses and then you reference the name of the pool that you've created for outside addresses. Now with dynamic PAT uh, it's a little bit different. You again have to define an access list for what addresses are permitted out and then say uh, IP NAT source number, interface, and then specify the interface number, and then overload at the end. This is why it's called NAT overload. Uh, so we have NAT diagnostics here. Uh, your show IP NAT, and there are lots of different variants of this. Uh, clear IP NAT translation is a very handy uh, command that you can use to clear your translation table. Um, if you have problems with NAT, you can actually just clear out your translations, and that may resolve some of your issues. Debug IP NAT will show translations as they're occurring real time. That just about wraps it up for now. Again, I encourage you to read into this in a little bit more depth in the book. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to leave it in the section below. Enjoy.